Thank you, Jordi. Uh, there is, in fact, uh, one question from Philip, Philip Lane. Okay, hey, so sorry to jump in, uh, and thanks, Jordi, for a very interesting uh, paper. And of course, uh, any of us, including myself, who've lived through a real estate uh, boom-bust cycle can appreciate the economics of misallocation, excess capital accumulation in the non-traded sector and so on. But I suppose I have two uh, quick questions, to call, uh, which I suppose will always come up with any paper uh, uh, which in, uh, in, in March of passing financial crisis. One is, uh, you know, the, the, the risk factor, which maybe you don't have in your framework, of de-anchoring inflation expectations. So, in other words, if, if you run a tighter monetary policy and you see inflation persistently uh, below target because, you know, you, you fear this misallocation, uh, there's a pro and a con. Uh, I think in the Woodford 2012 paper, that pro and a con is kind of uh, addressed about essentially a non-linearity the further away you are from 2%, uh, maybe the, the kind of uh, more reluctant to, at the very least, it's more of a trade-off. Uh, and then I, I'm not so sure I noticed it in the paper uh, whether macroprudential can do it all. So if you had a macroprudential instrument, uh, does it, or fiscal, because in a property boom, if you have kind of fiscal taxes on property uh, sector and so on, maybe that can do it. So, uh, of course, uh, it's just interesting to know whether those exist or not. But I don't know if you've thought, had yet a time in this framework uh, to think about the, those dimensions. Um, yes, well, thanks, Philip. Uh, those are very interesting and important questions. Uh, I, regarding the second one, um, we ignore macroprudential policy in, in our model uh, deliberately. It is clear that you know the nature of the um, the nature of the the, the distortion is uh, is uh, real. It's not a, it's not monetary, and hence that uh, you know there may be more natural tools to to confront it. And uh, one may you you know the first thing that may come to mind is maybe a tax on on capital, something that um, capital accumulation. Um, um, but of course, that raises also interesting issues because you know that, that tax is distortionary and, and, and may generate uh, a steady state with with uh, with inefficiently low capital and output and so on. So these things are to, to be taken into account. Now, what the way we 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 have deliberately restricted ourselves to monetary policy, okay, just for simplicity, and because we want to think of a of our framework as as uh, or we want to think of a situation in which you know other tools are in, are unable to completely eliminate the, the risk of financial crisis. Okay, so, so there's always some some residual um, re residual role for a central bank to to do, and th there may be one hundred reasons for this. One that uh, to me sounds uh, very plausible is that uh, if the other tools are in the hands of uh, you know a government, it will be reluctant to. It will be reluctant to use them uh, in order to to um, to stop the boom or to 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 dampen the boom. Okay, and that's when uh, an independent institution like a central bank may need to step in to correct uh, the resulting uh, uh, distortions or problems. Okay, now um, so. Again, it would be interesting, uh, you know, to incorporate also uh, microprudential tools and see whether there is some sort of interaction and so on. Okay, but uh, that's not what we do at this point. Now, regarding your first question, yes, uh, I agree. I mean, uh, our, we use a simple rule that is uh, linear, and at this point, we have uh, we have played with this uh, simple uh, rule. Or, you know, we, we on the other hand, we solve the model. Um, for the model non-linearly, so nothing should prevent us from from using non-linear rules in the in the future. And I think that the rules of the sort that you were non-linear rules of the sort that you were pointing to could be could be interesting to examine. We haven't done so. Thanks for the suggestion. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions also uh, still in the pipeline. One from Alejandro Van der Goethe. Uh, let me read it out. How different is, is your capital accumulation channel to a standard bank network channel? Uh, in the standard channel, banks can accumulate net worth over time, and with more net worth, they can purchase more physical capital and provide more financing to, to firms. 
more generally, how does your, your overall monetary transmission uh, mechanism differ from that in, in other new Keynesian models with endogenous financial crisis, whose financial sectors are built on, on uh, say, uh, BGG, uh, BGG 1989 uh, mechanism, such as Mendoza et al. and uh, Van der Goethe et al. Yes, so that's that's a question that would uh, it's an important question that would take uh, require a long time because there are many you know many models with uh, financial friction. So what one also talk, go on a case by case basis. Let me just say that in our in in our model we don't have this kind of balance sheet effects that uh, um, models uh, Labernanke, uh, Goethe, and Gilchrist have, for instance. Um, and uh, instead, we you know the loan market is perfectly competitive. There are no no there are no banks in our model. Okay, um, uh, and the novelty uh, I think in of our framework uh, relative to those the the others um, is that the the financial fragility arises uh, because of uh, capital accumulation, okay? and the and because of decreasing returns to capital the uh, decreasing uh, return to investment that results from excessive capital accumulation okay and 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 that um, that brings the economy closer to a situation in which um, uh, there is an incentive uh, for unproductive firms to misallocate their resources and hence a situation in which um, borrowing constraints have to be tightened endogenously Okay, so as opposed to some, most of the models in the literature are, are, are borrowing constraint is an endogenous one, and it varies over time depending on the state of the economy. Okay. Thank you. There is one last question. Uh, maybe I can I can read it out to, for you from Klaus Masuch. Um, you, you show that a monetary policy rule that strongly leans against output fluctuations or excessive capital accumulation provides extra insurance to households lowering precautionary savings and probability of crisis. Does this imply that monetary policy by a change to its policy rule can increase the natural rate of interest, at least in good times? So monetary policy, after all, can, can have an impact on the natural rate. That's, that's his question. Uh, well, I guess one one should um, see how the natural how the natural rate is defined here. You know, if the natural rate is defined as the as the equilibrium interest rate, as the okay as the as the equilibrium interest rate in the absence of nominal rigidities, for instance, and in the absence of financial frictions. Okay, that would be one uh, definition. Now, a monetary policy that cannot have um, an impact on the natural rate in, in our model. However, um, uh, what happens in our model instead, uh, we, we really don't use the, we didn't bring the natural, at this point, the, the, the concept of the natural rate into, into our analysis. It may, be, it may be useful to do in the future, but I can tell you what, what happens is that it is uh, optimal, it is optimal for the central bank to deviate from the natural rate. Okay, in particular, it is optimal for the central bank to, in 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 the face of uh, an excessive uh, or the uh, capital accumulation or what may be perceived as a the beginning of a of a potential run up to a crisis, it may be optimal. It will be optimal for the central bank to increase the interest rate above the natural rate. Okay, in contrast with what would be the prescription in the standard New Keynesian model without financial frictions. Thank you. Let, let me take one, one last question, really, from Oreste, Oreste Tristani. The literature has pointed out various reasons why deviations from perfect price stability may be desirable. Can you speculate on how powerful the mechanism in your paper is compared to others? Um, yes, that's, uh, um, of course, that's a question uh, that um, one, in principle, should uh, Address quant, quant, uh, quantitatively now, and, and as, or, as you say, you rested. There are many reasons why the central bank may want devi to deviate from price stability. Some of them uh, really mundane, if you want, uh, the presence of sticky wages, the presence of cost push shocks, and so on. All, all these th things call in our models for departures from a strict inflation targeting. Okay, now 
uh, we think that uh, um, obviously those are all important, but those apply if you want on a day-to-day -day basis, not in normal times. I think ours is one that should be in the minds of central banks in situations in which, in which um, you know, the risk of excessive capital accumulation um, uh, occurs. And, uh, and in that case, well, the pot potential consequences are huge. We know that uh, from uh, the recent experience uh, in the great financial crisis. We're not talking here about the small distortions, about, we're not talking about, uh, you know, relative wage distortions. We are not talking about, you know, situations in which there may be some deviation between the natural level of output and the efficient level of output because of uh, you know, uh, small changes in distortionary taxes or, or, or desired markups and so on. We're talking about the, pos the, the, the risks of financial crisis in which, uh, you know, um, a good chunk of output is uh, lost um, in a persistent way in which there are huge employment losses and so on. So this is more than, I would say, it's, it's, it's a first order relative to the kind of uh, deviations um, the re relative to the kind of uh, factors that may call for deviations from price stability that we usually have in our in our models. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Jordi, uh, for for this paper. is a uh, very 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 interesting with a strongly I would say strongly Austrian economics flavor to it. Um, and uh, let's let's move to uh, uh, Yuri Gorodnichenko, whom I see already in uh, okay. on, on the call. Thank uh, you, very Yuri, much. Uh, thank you, thank you.